I had a very funny notion earlier today that I would read up a little bit on what I'm going to talk to you about. <laughs> and uh, I started in this book and <laughs> got laughing because uh, it doesn't really amount to anything at all. It's all words about words. And uh, they were debating as to whether um, it was true that there's such a thing as causality or that there isn't whether the cause and effect are the same event or different events. And uh, they decided that they, they couldn't be the same because that would reduce the whole world to a, just a wadge of undifferentiated goo. <laughs> On the other hand, they decided they couldn't be completely different because they'd have no connection with each other. And so uh, the whole argument fizzled. Uh, and you have to realize that to what an enormous extent uh, we are all utterly bewitched by words and are trying all our lives long to solve problems which only words create because a human being has uh, got himself into a very funny bind having developed words which are enormously useful obviously uh, we at the same time pay a price for them and uh, we are simultaneously you see helped and bewitched by words. And so you could say that being under Maya, under illusion, is also being spellbound and enchanted. Because you, when you lay a spell, you do it by spelling. <laughs> you see, you, 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 you make a magic with words. When a, a, a mag stage magician uh, does some extraordinary feat in front of you, he always accompanies it with patter and his talk his line is to distract your attention from what he's actually doing and so by getting you enchanted with words you don't notice what's going on in the same way when people hypnotize you it's very difficult to hypnotize a person without talking to them but very easy if you talk and you can hypnotize people in all kinds of ways that don't involve uh, the standard routines that is to say, the standard routines are making people stare at a bright object or at some revolving disc or tricks of this kind. But you can induce hypnosis just with words. And they don't even know they're being hypnotized. <laughs> so, uh, in a way, then, it, it is all philosophical problems. And all religious problems are problems of language. Because if you don't use words, you don't have any problems. And that's the most extraordinary thing. You think, you see, that you've got words to help you solve your problems. So that you can communicate with each other about things and help each other out and so on. That's true. It does, to a certain extent, words do solve practical problems, like, please pass me the salt and uh, would you light the fire for me and uh, let's go for a walk uh, shall we uh, go hunting today etc all these things can be solved by words but then when you start uh, really getting deeply involved in words what you do is this uh, you assign words to various aspects of experience but the thing is that you wouldn't know what an aspect was unless you had words the world uh, is it's true we say it's differentiated because we see different shapes different colors and uh, different motions and uh, we assign words to these differentiations and so come to believe that the differentiations in the world are really different but actually uh, when you see a cloud, it's true, the cloud has uh, got lots of bumps on it. Now the question arises then, uh, how many bumps does a cloud have on it? And are these bumps the same as the cloud or different from the cloud? Well, that's an asinine question, uh, because it's only a question about how you're going to define it. It isn't a question about the cloud. And so, in exactly the same way as a cloud, uh, is constantly moving and changing or watch some cigarette smoke in the air 
uh, this is a lovely weaving pattern, watch it in a beam of sunlight, you know, and it's intricate, like a, a, a marvelous Moorish arabesque. But is each line of smoke a thing? Is it a separate event? Uh, now you, you see the Buddhists look at the world as a weaving of smoke. That uh, everything is in a state of flux or flow. And so the differentiation of things cannot uh, hold except as a purely abstract and intellectual construct. But the power of these words is such that they can alter your feelings. And you notice this in early childhood, that children become completely fascinated with words, and they squabble more about words than about anything. Also, children become fascinated by adults' sense of time. A ch child goes through a very strange uh, development, because on the one hand, a child has an enormous capacity for living in the present, for uh, getting completely lost in, say, throwing pebbles into the water and watching the, uh, the waves, or making funny noises and just making them and making them and making them, or sitting in front of a mirror and making faces. But the moment children uh, get involved with their parents and their parents' uh, system, which the children don't understand because parents playing... What happens, you see, adults play games and they don't let the children in on the rules. They say, you're not old enough to understand this yet. And they're not frank about it because they're not too clear themselves. So children are constantly obfuscated by our rules, but also fascinated. So then, uh, the time thing really gets children because they're taught that all the adults are busy looking forward to something, see? So there are great occasions like Christmas, Easter, uh, Thanksgiving, the 4th of July for fireworks, you see? And your birthday, and that's a special occasion. So children uh, get the, this feeling that they'd like the calendar to cut out all the intervening days and they just can't wait till the next th th event comes up. And uh, so they want uh, Christmas. And then boom, birthday. Then boom, Easter. You see, and boom, 4th of July. <laughs> or whatever like that, you see. Uh, they just can't wait. And uh, this is because, you see, they are showing their bewitchment. Then also another thing children do is calling each other names. They get very, very... Uh, head up because somebody says to Johnny you're a sissy and you call me a sissy and that's just terrible I am not a sissy or I am not uh, if, he, if he's learned to identify himself as a boy and somebody says he's a girl there's a real fight about that because they are terribly particular that the right word should apply to the right thing and I am not what you tell me I'm because the whole education of a child is really telling who he is all the teachers, all the adults, all the other children are constantly telling each other who they are. And alas, we believe it. And so you come not to know who you are at all. You come to believe that you're what everybody tells you you, you, you are. And so uh, this is, gets very funny indeed because we are uh, all at once telling each other that we are unique. See, you're different from me, and you're the only thing like you in the world. But at the same time, we're saying to each other, but you ought to be just like me. Because after all, if you're not uh, really like me, you're so far out, you're not human. And so the more we tell each other that we are like each other, the less point there is in talking to each other. Because after all, if you're just the same as I am, we've got nothing to talk about. I can't learn anything from you because uh, you're just like me. Then on the other hand, uh, if, you, if you really are different from me, then I can find out something I never knew before. But I told you who you were in the first place and you told me who I was. <laughs> so we're making each other up. <laughs> so long as, in that, that is to say, as we live in that domain of words and defining who and what we are. Now, 
look at this whole thing. This, this, is, the, this is the situation. Maya, then, is to a very large extent a verbal creation. You know, his cats and dogs, they don't have a religion, as far as anyone can see. They don't uh, go to church, they don't uh, have uh, big philosophical problems, and we say they're, for that reason, uncivilized. <laughs> but they're not really uncivilized. They have other things they do, which are just as complicated. But they don't have this hang-up with words. Words are magic, you see. In the beginning was the word. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, according to the Bible. And that means that not that the real world <coughs> that you are looking at now, this wasn't created by words. But the world of separate things, separate people, separate events, that was created by words. Now I hope this is, I've said this to some of you before because you've been to earlier seminars, but this is absolutely fundamental for understanding what the Buddhist Mahayana doctrine of emptiness is. Shunyata. You see, in Sanskrit, shunya means void, and the um, suffix ta means ness, so voidness. And all uh, the world is called sunyata, and that word doesn't mean that really there isn't anything, but it means there isn't anything. It is saying that the world does not consist of distinct things or distinct events. Things are nouns and events are verbs. And if you pick up uh, any uh, available, unhandleable piece of nature, uh, the idea that this is a thing is just an idea. Because you see, this that I am touching is not an idea. And it's not a thing, because you can ask immediately, well, how many things is it? Well, that depends on how you divide it. You can say, well, it has a top and a bottom. That makes two. Then there's cardboard covered with paper, and that makes four. But then what about all the letters printed on it? They are also things, aren't they? What about the constituent molecules, the distinct electrons that uh, prove themselves to be there upon physical analysis? How many things is it? It's as many things as you can figure. Because you see, a thing is a unit of thought. A thing is a think. In English, thing and think are alike. In German, ding and denken. In Latin, res means thing and reo means to think. To reify, we use even in English, means to thingify. When you say, for example, um, uh, The lightning flashed. Now, actually, the flash is the same as the lightning. So you reify a thing called lightning, which does something called flashing. And uh, so you create a ghost. And one of the great Chinese masters, uh, Lin Ji, lived in the Tang Dynasty about 800 AD, said that his work as a Buddhist teacher was to beat the ghosts out of you, to exorcise you, to, in other words, disenchant. And so one comes to understand that the, there are in nature no things and no events. So, this is the Sunyata doctrine. Things and events have only a verbal reality. And that is a thing that is as powerful for a person who is an intellectual as for a person who is not an intellectual. It isn't just that this is a problem from which the brainy people suffer. All human beings suffer from it because even uh, the less brainy people are just as 
subject to verbal enchantment and to spellbinding through the magic of words as the very intellectual people. A child will sometimes escape from this, as in the story of the emperor's new clothes, when it is the child who notices that the adults are, are deceiving themselves with words. So then, uh, <coughs> shunyata is uh, the assertion that, actually speaking, the real world which we will call, in our way of talking, the physical world, or the natural world, or even the material world, contains no things and no events. That things and events are purely abstract creations. Now, it's interesting, you see, that when we talk, try to designate the real world, we'll use, say, the word material. And this, people get terribly confused by this because we, we use the, the word material has opposed meanings within it, like the word responsible. If you say to someone you're responsible, this is at one moment telling them that you're free and able to make decisions on your own, but at the same time telling the person that you'd better decide uh, according to law because you'll be held responsible if you make the wrong decision it's telling them all in the same uh, breath that they're free and bound and of course this goes back to the original double bind that when society tells the child that it is a free agent in other words you are responsible the child is unable to resist this definition because a social influence on another person, especially a child, is completely strong and irresistible. So the child is thereby compelled to believe that it's free. Now, I'm not saying whether you are or are not free. This is not the point. You may be, you may not be. But to be told that you must be free is a contradiction. And that's the situation every child is put in. So on the authority of society, you are told that um, in a way uh, you're independent of society. And you must believe that you are because uh, we told you so. So when in the same way we use the word responsible and it has a double take in it, so does the word material. When uh, many people use the word material, they think they mean uh, what you can touch and see and so on. That is to say, the real world. But then there are another kind of people who want to say that the material world is an illusion and that the spiritual world is the only world that's real. Even uh, in, say, Judaism and Christianity, God is spirit, whatever that is. And God created the material world, so the material world is real, but a lower kind of reality than spiritual reality. St. Thomas Aquinas would define the material world as having contingent being as distinct from necessary being. Necessary being is being that is being, that exists of itself. It has what's called aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, which means it exists of itself. Buddhists use the words fabhava, uh, or own being uh, for this uh, same uh, Christian theological word. And uh, so, but when you, you start thinking, what do you mean by the material world? The word material is related to the word maya. Because matter is from the Sanskrit root, M-A-T-R, much, which is the same root from which Maya comes. And Maya, originally from the root martyr, means to measure. It's a word that's used in laying out the foundations of a building. In other words, marking off 
an area. You meter it. So the material world has a dual sense, you see. It means on the one hand, the world that is actually here, the real world, but it also means the world as measured. Now the world as measured is the way you figure it, not the way things are. So you, you see the duplicity in the idea of material? It, it, it works both ways. And so you say to about something, does it matter? Well, that means, is it substantial enough to worry about, or is it just a ghost? If it doesn't matter, then it's spirit. Uh, you know this Christian science joke, uh, what is matter, never mind. <laughs> what is mind, no matter. <laughs> So we say, mind out. Uh, use your mind. I mind whether this happens or not. But that's the same thing as saying, it matters whether it happens or not. And language is so exciting uh, when you start to analyze it in this way because it reveals uh, all, all, all the jokes that are in it. And so you, you, you discover then that many, many words, many fundamental ideas are full of duplicity. Uh, for example, in uh, the word cleave in English means to separate and to cling to. The word sacca in Latin means sacred and accursed. The word altus in Latin means high and deep. And in Egyptian, ancient Egyptian, they use words like strong weak. Well, that's how we would have to translate it. But you will find again and again, that the, these are just a few I mentioned, there are ever so many words that have this double take in them and mean both of a pair of opposites. And so the word material is one of the very best examples of this. So. When uh, the Buddhist says then that the, the nature of the world is shunyata, he is not saying that if you were truly enlightened, your state of consciousness would be blank. And therefore that there would be no colors, no shapes, no outlines, no uh, any kind of um, goings on. Although there have been Buddhists who did make that misinterpretation. If you read, for example, the Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, this is a Chinese Buddhist text uh, recording the sermons of a great teacher who lived about 700 AD. This was his sort of flourishing time. He died in 713. His major concern is combating the prevalent idea among many of his contemporaries that enlightenment consisted in having a blank mind. They practiced the way of meditation that I was talking about yesterday uh, when we were discussing samadhi as uh, voidness of consciousness. And they tried to stop their sense processes altogether. You can approximate that, you see, by concentrating on uh, a very, very restricted uh, sense field. Say, you can start counting your breathing, or you can focus your eyes on the little light on the tip of an incense stick, or on a spot, or anything. There's a Buddhist text, you know, uh, that describes this. And when it says, or on anything, the commentator has made a footnote and it says underneath, but not any wicked thing. <laughs> you know, clergy are the same the world over. <laughs> so, um, then when you concentrate on this small point, 
and you've got your mind absolutely closed on this, then the idea is to knock away the point. And there's nothing at all that you are not conscious of any differentiation. You keep your eyes closed, your ears plugged, and try to turn off everything else. See? Now this man, uh, the sixth patriarch, Hui Nun, said that is not Buddhism at all. That is a way to become a stone Buddha. And you might just as well be a lump of wood or a piece of rock. The real meaning of emptiness, he said, is like space. Because space contains all the universe, but isn't stained by it. In other words, you cannot knock a nail into space, but you can have a nail in space. So he said in the same way that the space is great, so the capacity of your mind or your original consciousness is likewise great. Whereas if you exclude everything, you make it small. So uh, what is negated in the idea of emptiness, of shunyata, is not the world that we call the physical world. What is negated is concepts about it. It is saying there is no conceptual framework in which you can pin this world down. Because you see, the human being uses his conceptual framework to try to cling to his existence. And he will try to cling to his existence when he has been fooled into thinking that non-existence could overcome existence. Now, in existentialism, uh, as it's set forward by people like um, Binz van uh, and Rollo May and so on, uh, they, uh, they keep saying, you are not an authentic human being unless you're anxious. Because the moment you realize that you exist, and this is indeed self-consciousness, this is coming to be aware of life, appreciating life, I exist and isn't that extraordinary. Then uh, you at the same time become aware that you have the possibility of not existing. The, is, as soon as you realize that you're alive, you know you could be dead. And so uh, this comes with what Kozhibsky called time binding. By uh, realizing time, by being able to predict the future, you see other people die, and you know you will die. Maybe animals don't worry about that. We don't know. Apparently, they live more in the present and uh, work on the assumption that they're immortal until they're not, which is a very good assumption. And uh, <laughs> But we predict, you see, so that the sensation of being implies non-being. But we don't see through this all the way. We think that non-being will swallow being. So that there will, whereas there's only non-being exists for a short time, non-being could go on forever. But we don't realize that non-being is as much dependent on being as being is on non-being. This is relativity. And shunyata also, besides meaning emptiness, means relativity. It means, uh, when you say, uh, in Madhyamika philosophy, this is called Madhyamika, that Nagarjuna invented. This is what the subject of the seminar, uh, just in case anyone's forgotten. Uh, <laughs> Madhyamika means the philosophy of the middle way. And the middle way refers to what is in common between all oppositions, but can't be stated, because when you talk, you can only talk about opposites. Since all words are labels on pigeonholes called classes. So when you say, does it exist or does it not exist? Is it in the category of existence, like a horn, or the category of non-existent like the horns of a rabbit. 
or the child of a barren woman, or a be eunuch's beard. You know, they have all these ancient metaphors that come from the Upanishads that go through all Buddhist literature. The horns of a hare. There is, incidentally, a bar in a place called Van Horn in Texas, very close to El Paso, where there is a stuffed uh, jackrabbit with horns on behind the bar. <laughs> Ever driven through there, I always get some postcards of it to send to my various Buddhist friends. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, the 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 point is in in saying that shunyata means relativity, saying that everything that we call a thing. Uh, or an event has no svabhava, which means no own being. This is how Edward Conzi translates it. Because it doesn't exist by itself. It only exists in relation to everything else. So in other words, you don't know that there is a material object unless you see it in a space. So the space and the object support each other mutually. You wouldn't know the space was there unless the object was there. So although you think about things as if they existed independently, that's because you're bewitched. But when you go into it more deeply, you realize, of course, nothing can exist by itself. Everything goes with everything else. But this is above all true of you. If you say, I am a thing, I am an event, this is because you've made the mistake of identifying your actual uh, reality with your idea of yourself, which is only a symbol. And so we are panicked, going back to the way the child is brought up, by our ideas of ourselves. People say, you are this, you are that, you are the other thing. Now, you are the winner. Hooray! You're the loser. Oh, see? Uh, that's awful. But actually, you're neither. You say to somebody, you know, you're going to go on living. Hooray. Put off dying for another few years. Great. They say, no, you must die at once. Oh, that's terrible. It's no different. Because all you're going to get gain with more time is more anxiety. Longer to worry about. <coughs> What's your objection to dying now? It's just an idea. That's what gives us trouble. Oh, it hurts. Well, what about that? Pain. This is a thing that is very largely educated. Uh, when, as a child, you have pains, your mother says to you, Oh, you poor darling. And you think about yourself, oh, my poor darling, <laughs> you see? <laughs> when you throw up, you vomit, she says, ugh. When you go to the toilet and you make smells, she says, ah. But you know you liked that smell originally. It was great. Uh, especially your own. But you were taught not to like it. And then when people were around you, your friends, and relatives and old people and they started to get sick and die you watched everybody worry about them and then you learned to worry so all this conditioning uh, is put into you that it's great to go on living it's terrible to stop living you see all this is is learned where well, actually there's no problem about it. stop implies start just to start implies stop don't you realize that um, anything that happened once can happen again? Where were you before you were born? 
Uh, any recollections? And suddenly, here you were. All right, where do you go when you're dead? Same place you were before you were born. Where else is there to be? Can you experience nothing forever and ever? So, you see, the nature of being is not just being. The nature of being is being non-being. And uh, this, though, is only words. This is why in the Buddhist doctrine they say it is neither being nor non-being. Nobody can say what it is. You can only show it. That's why in Zen, when you ask what is the ultimate nature of Buddhism, uh, the master does this. Or he may just say, aha. Now, this is no symbolism attached to this. He's not saying the ultimate nature of Buddhism is in some way or other symbolized by a matchbook box. Or that a matchbox is uh, um, a manifestation of the universal energy field. You see? All that is talk. The point is, get to this. So it is called not only shunyata, which means voidness or relativity, it's called tathata. Tathata, we translate suchness. And tathata is simply thatness. When a child first starts talking, it says ta. It's the first thing a child says, ta, ta, ta. And in our culture, we say it's calling its father. And we say da, da. Unless it says ma first, and then it means mama. But the child is actually saying ta, which is our word that. See? Point. Ta, 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 ta. So ta, ta, ta is the thatness. It's there, you see, what you can't talk about. So then. The real nature of samadhi, or in, in meditation, is to learn to be aware without using words. And you find that, of course, you're hypnotized by words, and they keep running in your head automatically, and you believe them. But uh, the, the, the art of practicing, uh, say, zazen, is to, to learn not to exclude anything from your senses. <coughs> Let all sights and sounds and smells and feelings come to you, but don't call them anything. Stop naming them. Because, after all, if you keep talking and thinking all the time, do you realize you have nothing to think about except thoughts? Supposing I never stop talking, some of you only know me in a talking scene, and you may think <laughs> that I talk all the time. I don't. I occasionally listen to other people talk and read what other people have to say. That gives me something to talk about. <laughs> well, now, thinking is a kind of talking. Thinking is subvocal talking. Now, if I think all the time, I don't have anything to think about except thoughts. So, to have something to think about, you must stop thinking some of the time, just as you must stop talking some of the time to know what other people have to say. So meditation is the art of stopping thinking for the time being. That's the first stage of it. There's a second stage. I'll explain in a moment. But the first stage is to learn how to suspend thought. And you can do that by thinking about nonsense. That's why those chants that they sing, that I played to you, don't mean anything at all. And they are for the purpose of stopping thinking. Because the easiest way to do it is instead of trying to stop thinking, is to look at your thoughts as meaningless words. That's when it's funny. You know you get a funny feeling by taking the word yes and saying it several times. And you think, well, that's a strange noise that we use, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And so, by this way, you tease yourself out of thought and you get into the no-thought state. Then when you are in the no-thought state and you are simply observing the world without commentary, you will realize that there are no problems in the world. There is no time. 
Likewise, there is no eternity. There is no this, and likewise, there is no that, because this and that are purely verbal creations. So if you want to say anything at all, you just call it suchness. Now then, when you can do this, you will discover that you can go a stage further, that you can go on thinking, but uh, fundamentally preserve an attitude of not thinking. You, don't, you aren't under the limitation as if to say to yourself, well, you mustn't think, that would be naughty. That would be the wrong, non-Buddhistic thing to do. <laughs> you can perfectly well think and conduct all kinds of practical business and uh, uh, live a complete human life. But once you've learned the secret of what's called mushin in Zen, no mind, or void mind, uh, you, you can go on because you're no longer fooled by your thoughts. So, we had a marvelous discussion in Japan with a Zen master. Uh, he was saying, uh, the whole, he was explaining, just as I've explained to you, uh, all about meditation being non-thinking. And uh, then he said, you know, it's the same way as the Japanese carpenters. They build without a plan. And so in the same way, uh, you don't need a conceptual framework to live your life. So I asked him a question. I said, I think he got the point that the interpreter was functioning. Because later we had another conversation in which he made the most beautiful little thing. When he said we were discussing all the people who were translating the various texts of Zen Buddhism into English. And he said this is a waste of time. There's no need to translate all this stuff. Because he said if you really understand Zen you can use any book. You can use the dictionary, the Bible or Alice in Wonderland. He said, after all, the sound of the rain needs no translation. So when once uh, a monk asked a Zen master, how do you get into the path? See, all I've been talking is theory. Now, you ask me, how do you practice it? And he replied, do you hear the stream? He said, yes. He said, there is the way to enter. 